Hello, 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 hello. This is Stories for Kids with Morel podcast. Oh, yes, it's story time. I have my story bell ring a ding, ding a ding, ding a ding. <laughs> All right, I've got my story bell. And also, Birdie is along with me. Birdie, say hello. Hello, Birdie. <laughs> hello, Birdie. <laughs> All right, okay. Good to have Birdie here. And good to have you here with me. I hope you are sitting very comfortably. And so, I'm going to start a new story. This story will be in two parts. It's a little bit long. So we'll do one part and then we'll come back again. All right. Okay. You were saying, what is the story about? What's the title of the story? The title of the story is The Raccoon and the Bees. The what, Morel? Okay. I'll say it again. The Raccoon and the bees. Raccoon spell R A C C O O N. Raccoon. And I'm sure you know how to spell bees. B E E S. The raccoon and the bees. So, all right, I'm ready. So, hopefully, you are ready. Let's begin. The story about the raccoon and the bees. A raccoon was dozing, perched up in a big tree one fine, bright summer day. He lay on a broad limb high up in the tree. There was a fresh breeze stirring, and he swayed to and fro with the branches. He had been rocking on this lofty perch for some time, with his eyes half closed, when he was roused by the shouting of some small, barefooted boys who were playing in a hayfield close by. Cooney, as he was called for short, after yawning and stretching for some minutes, finally shifted his position so as to see the boys. He had watched them often from the top of a tree, and he always enjoyed the fun, because they did such queer things. It was some minutes before he could find out what they were doing, but at last he discovered that they had found a bumblebee's nest. They had long paddles in their hands and were running around yelling and waving the paddles frantically. Occasionally, One of the boys screamed, and then several of the others would run towards him, all beating the air with their paddles. Cooney watched very closely and saw one boy run up to the hive, give it a quick poke, and then scamper away. With every poke at the hive, a number of bees would fly out of the opening and sail away on the air. Finally, a small boy approached the hive and gave it a hard poke. Instantly, about a dozen bees swarmed out and the boy started to run. He had gone but half a dozen feet, however, when he tripped and fell. And by the way he rolled and kicked, it was plain to be seen that the bees were getting the better of him. It was great fun watching them. And Cooney decided that he would get a nearer view 
So he crawled down the tree in a hurry and ran to the big oak at the edge of the field. From there, he could get a full view of the battle. He chuckled to himself as he thought of the fun he was having all by himself. The battle between the boys and the bees was raging furiously by this time. The boys charged time after time and with each attack became bolder and bolder until finally Cooney saw that they were winning. The plucky little bees fought bravely to defend their home but the boys were too strong for them and one by one they fell and were crushed or beaten to pieces with the paddles. After two or three pokes of the hive to make sure that none of the bees remained, a great shout went up from the boys who surrounded the deserted nest. Oh, now children, listening to the story. Have you, have you ever seen a wild bee's nest? I mean, a real bumblebee's home. Have you? Well, they are nearly always built on the ground and are made of little pieces of grass piled and woven together into a little mound. At the very top, there is a small hole which is used as the doorway through which the bees enter. The wall is not very thick, but is put together tightly so the wind will not blow it away and it is hollow. It is in this mound that the bees store their honey for the winter. I mean, during the warm summer days, they work hard, carrying tiny drops of honey, which they gather from the flowers and storing it, so they will have something to eat during the cold weather. When the cold winds come in the fall and winter, and the flowers are dead, the little workers stop their labour and gathered together in the home they had been preparing all summer. When the snow comes, the little grass storehouse is buried snug and warm underneath the white blanket. It was just such a nest as this that Cooney watched the boys robbing off its treasure. Poor little bees. All their hard work had been in vain and they had even lost their little lives in the brave effort to protect their winter's food and supply. But even from his hiding place, Cooney could see that the boys had not won the battle without some losses. Big lumps were beginning to swell up on their faces and arms, and the little boy who had tripped and fallen could hardly see because his eyes were nearly swollen shut. The boys tore away the mound and took out the honey, layer by layer, and squeezed out the golden syrup. Just as they were licking the last drops, from their sticky fingers. Cooney saw a man walking towards them. When he was near enough, the man began talking to them in an angry way. Why, Mr Jones, Cooney heard one boy say, you don't use bumblebee's honey, do you? 
No, boys. I don't use the honey myself. But I don't want you to kill the bees or rob their nests so they will have to starve. Bees do a great deal of good on the farm. Well, what good are bumblebees? One of the boys asked. Why? They do a lot of good. They distribute the pollen from the heads of the clover, and that makes the seed mature and develop. This was news to Corny, for he never knew before that bumblebees were of any use. But then, he had never had much to do with them. One day, when he was playing, he had caught a bee in his little paws and had received a sting and he never forgot how sore his paws were and how they swelled so that he was unable to climb for several days. Since that time, he had always made it a practice to move away when a bee came too close. After the boys were gone and Farmer Jones had gone back to his house, Cooney decided that he would go over to the field and see what the inside of the bee's nest looked like. As he approached the field where the battle had taken place, much to his surprise, he saw his friend, Woodchuck, snooping around among the ruins. When Cooney reached him, he sat up on his hind feet and began licking his paws. Hello, Chuck, Cooney said. What are you doing? Why's your face? A sight. My, such a dirty face. Why, Chuck? I am surprised. And he noticed the greedy look in Chuck's eyes. Mmm, yum, yum, was the only reply he received, and Chuck began picking around in the grass. I say, Chuck, Cooney said again, what are you doing? Doing? echoed Chuck. Why, this is a Best food I've had for a long time, Cooney. My face may be a little sticky, but it can be washed, so I don't care. Such a treat as I have had. I'm sorry you missed it all. I saw some boys capering and scampering around here this afternoon, and as soon as they left I came over to see what it was all about, and this is what I found. And Chuck held up a small yellow pod. Just taste one, Cooney. It is sweeter than any berry I've ever tasted. Yum, yum, yum. It is fine. Hum, sniffed Cooney. It may suit your taste, but honey is much too sticky for me. Well... I'm glad you don't want any, Chuck replied. You always were rather particular, but I am only Chuck anyhow. And as some people call me a hog, um, a a ground hog, you know I might as well live up to my name. But Chuck, just go down to the brook and look at your face. Chuck, seeing that his supply of sweets was exhausted, did as Cooney suggested and waddled towards the brook, Cooney accompanying him. As Chuck was washing his face and paws, Cooney remarked that he knew where there was plenty of the kind of honey Chuck had been feasting on. Only, he added, um, it's much cleaner 
than what you have been eating. Oh, Cooney, tell me where it is, won't you, please? cried Chuck, stopping his toilet and catching up with Cooney's paw. I just dearly love it, and I'll be your lifelong friend if you will tell me where it is so I can get some more. Now, Cooney felt very mischievous, and he thought of a plan that would give him some fun. Why, Chuck, he replied, you would not expect me to tell you where all this honey is, would you? You would go eat it all up in one night. You are such a hoggy, you know. Oh, be a good friend, Cooney, and tell me, if you only knew how badly I want some more. Hmm, well, I'll tell you, Cooney said, but there may be some danger in getting it. I'll never stop for the danger, Chuck boasted. Hmm. You remember Farmer Jones, don't you? I should say I do. I'll never forget the whole family. Do you remember the time we were caught stealing the corn in his crib last fall? And oh, that fierce dog. Indeed, I never will forget him. If it is Farmer Jones's honey... It is perfectly safe, for it makes me shiver to think of that dog, Jack. Oh, I knew that you would be afraid, taunted Cooney. Tomorrow is Saturday, and the Joneses always go to town on Saturday. I had been planning to go over and give myself a little treat. But, Cooney, how about the dog? Oh, he goes to town with them. I've watched them from the tree where I live, and they never miss going on Saturday afternoons and taking the dog with them. But how do you know where the honey is, Cooney? How? Why? I've often sampled it. Now, listeners, Cooney told a falsehood when he said he had eaten some of the honey. But he was anxious to have some fun. And so he resorted to a falsehood in order to carry out his plans. This plan never pays, as you will see later. Have you really sampled it, Cooney? Chuck asked. And is it good? And is it very hard to get? Chuck was all excitement, for he could not get rid of the memory of the taste of the honey he had just been eating. Hard to get, repeated Cooney. Why, Chuck? There are great piles of it. And knowing the grounds as I do, it will be easy to get it. Now, you meet me tomorrow and I'll take you over with me. Meet me by the big oak tree in the corner of the woods. Just after noon tomorrow. I must leave you now because... I'm going fishing tonight with some of the other coons that live near me. Goodbye until tomorrow. Goodbye. And Cooney went away with a chuckle. Okay, how about I will do the second part of the story soon. So I'm saying goodbye for now. And Birdie too. Hi, Birdie. (coughs) Bye, Birdie.
<laughs> okay, goodbye, everyone. But I will be back. I will be back very soon with the last part. Yes, for the final part, and tell you how this story actually finishes. So I will be back soon. So stories for kids. Yeah, stories for kids with Morel Podcast. I will be back soon, to, and I'll tell you how the story ends. So join me soon. Okay, and do subscribe. Do subscribe to this podcast and tell others about it. So. I'll see you soon. All right. Say bye for now. Bye.